Welcome. Thanks for coming. Really excited to be here. I can't get over this wall of books. It's just phenomenal. I'm going to do this in my house. Um, yeah, so we're here to talk about gamifying POI data collection. Um, I am Diana Shkolnikov. For those of you that haven't met me yet, um, hope to meet all of you. But um, at StreetCred, which is the company that I work for, we collect POI data. We're very focused on that particular sector of data. And we're also trying to crowdsource it, similar to what OSM is doing. Um, so it's kind of a mundane task to collect this kind of data, right? And data in general. Um, and a wise woman once said, in every job that must be done, there's an element of fun. You find the fun and snap, the job's a game. This is where I was gonna sing the rest of the song, but then my kids said, this will be on video, so don't embarrass yourself. Um, you know how it goes. Uh, but the idea is that you could take something that's boring and a task and a chore and turn it into a fun game and it makes the job go quicker and it makes people wanna do it. It's just part of um, human psychology. And so we're trying to get some of that feeling into data collection. The definition, according to Wikipedia for gamification, is the application of game design elements and game principles in non-game contexts. So taking something boring, turning it into a fun thing. And there are some elements that are considered kind of game staples um, that we started to try to implement in our approach to data collection. And I wanna just cover a few of them. There's lots more. Um, we're experimenting with different ones going forward and thinking about how do we weave that game theory and game design into everything that we're doing uh, to make it feel more like, like a fun task and not something that uh, is boring and a chore. Um, so some of the ones I'm gonna cover today is that how do you tell a narrative, competition and what aspects make, make a game feel like a competition, um, obstacles and constraints, which are kind of the rules of the game, uh, community uh, and choice and control. So just to kind of give you a little bit of context and what we've done, the last time we were at State of the Map, we were just wrapping up um, our first contest and it was Map NYC, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But we did three of these different rounds of competition around different cities and with slightly different rules to see what would work well and what, what didn't land um, and what we could learn before we build the final uh, game as we put it out there. So. Round one was Map NYC, as I mentioned. It went for four weeks, so a full month. Um, $50,000 prize pool, which we distributed in Bitcoin. So we wanted to also introduce people to cryptocurrency. Um, it was an exciting aspect to those that, that were new to it. And the objective was to fill in an empty map. And that's a time lapse of uh, the contest over the course of the month. So you could see by day. Um, we did really well. The community collected 20,000 plus POIs. We had 100 people on the leaderboard and we awarded uh, the money to those people uh, based on their place. Um, then we did Map Austin. So we repeated the process in Austin again for a month. This was in March of 2019. Um, again, a 50,000 prize pool. We limited the number of winners to just 50 this time. We saw that 100 leaderboard of 100 people was just too long. Um, the really the top 50 were the most engaged. And so we wanted to capture that and transfer the, the financial rewards to the most engaged folks. So we cut it down to 50. We collected over 10,000 POIs. Um, in this particular contest, we also set a goal that we wanted to reach. So we set a 10,000 goal and we saw the community really push together to get to that goal of POIs. It's a less dense city than New York. So we didn't see as many records collected there. Um, and the objective was to fill in an empty map, but we also had a commercial partner for this round. Um, and that partner really wanted building facade data. And so we were driving our users to also collect specialized data as it pertained to places. So that was unique um, to that round. And then we did round three, which we just wrapped up in June. That was Map NYC, Refresh, and Map LA. We wanted to see what it would look like if we ran the contest on a map that was already kind of filled in. So in New York, we preceded the data that we already collected in the first round um, and in LA and both in LA and New York, we also imported partner data that needed to be cleansed. Um, and it was an interesting dynamic and that was kind of the different spin there. So we had this concept of completing a place instead of creating one, you could 
or you could remove a place that was not valid um, if it came from the import. But to complete a place, you had to provide an image um, and fill in the, the missing data. We had two leaderboards, 50 people on each one. Um, we collected over 20,000 POIs total. Um, and there were $20,000 pools on each city. Um, so just to, now that we have that context, I'll talk about the different aspects of the games that we tried and how they apply here and how you could, you could what you could do with them in general. But the narrative is really important. It's the story that you tell your players. Why are they doing this? It kind of gives them context. Um, you know, you could see this in missing maps. They do this well, where it's like there is a disaster happening and we need to, you know, we, we have a challenge that's sp specifically around this area or specifically around this type of data. Um, participants love that storytelling aspect. They love to be part of something bigger, like a movement or understanding how their actions fit into this, this context. Um, what we found, what was interesting, is that the empty map scenario actually drove engagement uh, more. People were more engaged during that phase than, than the sparse map or just a different kind of engagement. But create creations of new data um, were much higher during the empty map uh, contest in New York. And when we did have a map already, when people would join, they felt like there was already stuff there. So they, they just did different activities but they weren't as engaged to like fill in an entire block of data. Um, and I think this kind of this kind of resonates with folks about the tiger import where there's debate whether or not that, you know, led to fewer contributions or not, but this was an interesting dynamic to see as well. And we were trying to compare and contrast how that worked. Um, we also did this concept of bonuses. So we bonused um, extra points during the contest um, for remote areas in New York, for example, we bonused going out to boroughs that were further, further out. So you would get extra points for creation there and validation as well. Um, and the specific categories, and we had narratives around, um, you know, in Austin, we were looking for food deserts. Uh, so we were driving folks to collect data about, um, food providers. So grocery stores, farmers markets, that sort of thing. And so people really love those stories of like, okay, I get why I'm doing this and I'm going to drive further out of my way to, um, to hit up the Bronx, um, and map some restaurants there, you know, that, and that just became like a thing that, that drove people. Um, so it's really important to tell the story. The competition aspect of it, this is, um, there's a few things that make, make it feel like a competition. There are three that kind of go hand in hand and people call them the PBL triad, which is the points, badges, and leaderboards. They usually, you'll see them all together. Um, it's a common thing. So we did have points and leaderboards. We didn't get into badges. There was just not enough time given that our, um, aggressive schedule to roll this out, but we do want to get to that eventually, um, in future versions. So we did do points. Um, you would earn points for accurate place creation uh, and validation. We also had this concept of pending points versus actual points. So the actual points were the only thing that mattered for the leaderboard, but your pending points would tell you that if other people validated your work, those points would turn into actual points. Uh, but they would just kind of be held um, in this pending state until your work was approved because we wanted people, we wanted to encourage people to do good work and, and provide data that was actually accurate. And the validation piece got into that. And I'll talk more about validation in further slides. Um, and if you, if your data was not approved, then your pending points were forfeited. And we did different things with points, again, bonusing things. Um, in the first contest, we didn't give any actual points until places were validated. And then in Austin and the, um, the map LA contest, we did give some immediate points and then held on to kind of the bonus points for val once the place was validated. And that just had a slightly different dynamic. Um, in New York, people were driven to do more validating because they knew that was the only way to unlock points. Uh, whereas in the other ones, they focused more on creation and, um, adding facade imagery for the buildings and other things. Um, so it was interesting to see the dynamic shift just based on how we awarded points. And we also have, bless you, we had a leaderboard. Um, it was updated in real time, which is really important. A lot of our users were obsessed with refreshing that leaderboard. Um, we saw that being one of the most popular endpoints um, in our API, but it gave them context for what others are doing. There's no other social interaction in the game. Um, so this was their way to see who's working, 
um, around them. There was also a live map that you could see updating um, on our website. So people were checking that out to kind of um, correlate the map activity to what was happening on the leaderboard. And they were devising all of these strategies based on what they were seeing on the leaderboard, which we didn't, you know, we didn't tell anyone about these stories. And we wanted to show the pending points on the leaderboard so that it would give people an understanding that someone is working, even if they're not, if, even if they don't have actual points. Um, but it became a whole strategy piece. And when we talked to people in our after parties, um, they had all these plans and, and schemes around how they were like watching people's pending points and it would drive them to do activity um, when they were otherwise not going to go out and play that night or something. Um, so the leaderboard was really motivating, motivating for people. Um, and also, as I mentioned in Austin and the third contest, we had this threshold that we were, we wanted the community to kind of come together and reach that threshold. And if they did, then it would unlock extra, um, extra bonus rewards. And so you could see in Austin, that was really exciting for folks. Um, yeah. And I just wanted to give a shout out. We didn't invent leaderboards and, and points. Um, Missing Maps actually does a beautiful job of this. They have really cool badges. So I just wanted to, to shout out to them. I think that's really cool. And I think their, their particular challenges and driving folks to do things um, around events is really successful. So that's that. Um, the next thing to cover is obstacles. And so this is the, the challenges that you build into the game to make it more interesting. Um, you know, you could take a game like golf, for example, it would be easier if the hole was really close and if there were no sand pits and if you didn't have to all, you know, only use a club, but those are the limitations and obstacles that make the game interesting. And if everyone that plays the game agrees on those obstacles and agrees to play fairly, then the, the game is fun. Um, so we had a couple of obstacles that we built into the game that we thought were not only beneficial to the data collection process, but also interesting um, to the players. One was physical presence. Um, we required that you be within 100 meters of the place that you were either creating or validating. So it had to be hyper-local. And that's, that's really important for this type of data for POIs particularly, right? Because you can't trace satellite imagery for this. You can't see it from... Um, from street view, you really kind of have to be on the ground and you sometimes have to go in there and ask people what the hours are because that changes and it's not always posted. Um, it's not always on people's websites for, for businesses. Not all businesses have websites. So that was a really important thing for us. Um, and also providing a photo of the place, kind of, we use the EXIF data. We try to try to make sure that you were there at the time that you said you were there. We also wanted to avoid people uploading photos off of other um third-party data sources. So we didn't want anyone kind of scraping the web for data and playing from their, from their couch. So this worked out really well. And again, because you could see immediately on the map that your activity was, was making an impact and you could see the map filling in, people really enjoyed that because they were right there and it, it felt really satisfying as they reported. The other big thing was validation. And I covered this a little bit already, but this is one of the biggest challenges in collecting this kind of data and, and crowdsourcing in general. Um, knowing whether or not a submission is good or bad um, can kind of make or break your project, right? So if you're allowing people to just put junk in there, um, that's never going to be good. So we wanted validation to be built into the game in some way. And so we, we required that a place that was created has to be approved by two other people in order for it to get accepted and in order for people to get their points. And so we iterated a lot on validation because it is a big problem. We're going to continue to iterate on it over the course of the next few months as well and, and probably well into the, the future because it's so it's such a difficult problem to solve. Um, but in Map NYC, we had a really basic screen. We were just kind of playing around with the concept. It was a single screen that showed you all the data in one shot and was like, is this good or bad? And people could say yes or no. Um, we had a lot of engagement on that feature, but not all of it was correct. So sometimes people were just like, all right, this is fine, approved. So we got a lot of approvals. Um, not all of them were correct. So we wanted to drill into that a little bit and make it a little bit more challenging for people and, fo and uh, force them to focus on the data. So we split out each of the properties into its own screen and asked the user to yay or nay those. 
And you could see, so we had like one for the name and one for the photos where you could scroll through if there were multiple photos, um, the address, the hours, anything else that we collected, um, we wanted to be validated. And this was better. Um, we, it took people a little bit longer to do each one, but the results were better. We had more um, accurate approvals, uh, but we still wanted to do get to get better at it because we felt like people still didn't like that they were saying no to someone else's record. So they, they reported kind of feeling bad about rejecting data. So in the next one, we turned it into a quiz. So we wanted to get away from approving or rejecting, and we wanted it to be kind of a confirmation of reality. And we created kind of a quiz. We also required a photo because we felt like that, um, First of all, that was extra data that we could collect about the place, but also it would prove that the person was there and that they were engaged and, and they were in the right place. Um, and the quiz was a multiple choice where it made sense or a true or false for the things that were Booleans. Um, but a multiple choice for hours, for example, would be just like, tell us the hours on Tuesday. Here's, here's the one, one of these answers. You don't know which one is the actual answer the first user created. Um, and then the others are, one is random and one is like, it's open 24 seven. So this led to much more accurate approvals, but again, because of the amount of time it took, we had slightly fewer submissions, but I think quality overall, this was driving in the right direction. So it was interesting to see how that evolved. Um, so now moving on to community when we first started building the game, we were really privacy focused. So we thought, you know, location is so fraught with, um, privacy concerns and we didn't want anyone knowing where other players were so they couldn't you know target them in any way so we didn't build any sort of community or player interaction into the platform but we saw that quickly teams started to form and people people just want to be a community they want to play together they want to collaborate um, and so we've been learning a lot as we go about how people want to play together so teams was kind of a big thing um, organically formed, and we, we hope to build that into future versions of the product. Um, also, we were surprised that people wanted to share their work publicly. Um, again, because of privacy reasons, we thought, you know, if you're mapping your neighborhood or some other neighborhood, you don't necessarily want that on display for people to know where you've been. But, um, but people really like the idea of sharing the volume of their work. Um, and so we want to make sure that that in future versions that we do that. Um, and we're learning a lot about what users want from that perspective and being able to say, uh, share that in social media as well. Um, and people, it was interesting. So in Austin in particular, we saw that the 10 K places, uh, limit. And, um, we saw people on Twitter trying to reach out to others and being like, Hey, let's all band together and like get this 10 K places. Um, even though there was no other avenue for them to connect. Um, so they really, they really wanted to reach out. And then when we did our wrap up parties, which we did at the end of every event, People on the leaderboard were invited to, to come to an after party. They were so eager to meet the other players that they only knew by handle, you know. Um, I think it's similar to the community in OSM where you kind of get to once a year, you, you get to hang out and see who these people are that are mapping and, and what are their um, interests and why what brings them to this. So I think there was a similar dynamic there and we're learning a lot about the people's desire for community and OSM does a great job of that, as you guys know. Um, choice and control. So you, you kind of have a, have to have a sense of autonomy in a game and it's really important to give people a feeling of like, I, I make, you know, my own destiny here. I know where I'm going to go. And so, you know, it was really, we, we heard a lot from users that they really like to explore new areas. And even though we did bonuses, it was their choice to go to the, one of the places versus another. And, and, um, it created some great memories for a lot of our participants that they, um, they can't wait to get back into since we've been kind of in between contests. Um, they're all asking what's next. Um, also the data that you create, you know, and talk about control here, the data that you create should belong to you. And so we've written some blog posts about this. If you guys are interested, check out our blog, but, um, the data that a person, that an individual creates, they can ask to download. Um, and we'll build that into the, the app itself in the future. So you could do that from the, from the web or the app where you can request the data download and all of that data is belongs to the creator. So you, you have the license to that and you can trace it into OSM or do whatever you'd like with that, share it publicly. Um, don't share it, sit on, sit on it. Um, but yeah, it's available for that, for the download. Um, 
we're hoping to figure out a way to create it like a like the GPS trace layer uh, and see if we could allow people to just trace that data right into OSM as well. We definitely want to be inclusive of this community and, and help. POIs are just really difficult and they, you know, in OSM, there's not a, a great uh, set there and it's not, not uh, well, it's not super fresh. So we'd like to help with that as much as we can. And so in summary, um, Game mechanics are well suited. We've seen this work really well. The contests were great. We're hoping to take this into future where it becomes less of a contest and more of an ongoing game that you could just kind of play, um, you know, kind of like Ingress or Pokemon Go situation where there's always something to do um, and it's going to be global. So we're not going to be limiting it to just the city anymore. Um, players want that good story. They want to be part of something epic, you know, um, so wherever we could give that to them. That's what we look for. Um, points and badges and leaderboards are motivating. Um, people want more community and social interaction. And validation is hard, which I think we all know. Um, thanks. How are we doing on time? Are we good for questions? One or two? OK. Yeah. Um, we were using Google um, and Facebook Auth, so that's that's the only those are the only options. So we didn't collect any additional information from them except their email, um, which was from, coming from that profile. So I have another question yeah. Um, that's what sure. In the back. That's a great question. Um, a lot of people said that they came into the game for the for the financial incentives because that was the thing that obviously we marketed, but then they stayed for the game of it and they got sucked in. They were like, oh, we were just going to test it out, but then they got sucked in because of the leaderboard um, and they saw that they were, you know, that they were climbing the leaderboard and then someone was there trying to take over. Um, so it pushed them to work. People worked like weekends and uh, would wake up at 5 a.m. And I mean, there were some folks um, that I talked to here that were p participants in the Austin game and they were really engaged. So it was it was really phenomenal to see that. that um, and also to say that none of these people were previously map, or I shouldn't say none, I'm sure there were some, but they weren't map enthusiasts um, or cryptocurrency enthusiasts. They were just kind of people that wanted access to both. Um, and it was a really interesting dynamic. Yeah, um, great question. We only saw that in New York, actually, in the first contest. Um, they, yeah, you would, but um, it, they were trying to script it to to validate things. But we had we had put protection in place. We had audits where we were watching if someone was like taking action faster than a human could travel, you know, the, between those distances. So um, they were sloppy and and made mistakes where they they, they traveled too far. Um, but other than that, we really haven't seen any malintent. Like people were generally really good players. Um, we didn't even we didn't have any inappropriate photos, which we were worried about. So we put all these things in place to protect ourselves from that. But then we kind of found that those were all quiet. We did we were running the audits, but they weren't finding anything because people were they just wanted to map their city. And you know, not not all the photos were great, but most of them the, there was nothing offensive. And um, other than that New York incident, there wasn't anyone trying to script. No, it was all built into this. So you would just get points based on your activity. So validation was worth slightly fewer points than creation. And so each action had some points associated with it. Um, and the points would add up in your profile. And that's what would show up on the leaderboard. So any action you took would all go towards your um, place in the, le in the leaderboard. Wrapping up? OK. Yeah, I'm happy to, I'll be around for the rest of the day. Happy to chat. Thank you guys for coming.